example, again, from the National Labor Committee. A pair of Puma sneakers in the United States will sell for about $70. From that, the company gets about $34 in profit. However, these sneakers are produced in Puyan, China, for about $1.16. It takes $1.16 to produce that pair of sneakers. So clearly, the Chinese worker is not getting much of that benefit in wages, and neither is the consumer getting much of that benefit in lower consumer prices. Most of that benefit for globalization is being kept by the corporation itself. So the Chinese worker, or the Indian worker, may not be able to clear uh, the markets with all that's being produced. So off it goes here. And again, you're going to say to me, well, again, John, you got a problem because the economy is working. We're not seeing the markets collapse or anything. That's the problem. Well, the problem is that the markets are clearing, but the problem is how they're clearing. <laughs> and the way that they're clearing is through debt. Now, I know that that can be uh, debated in terms of, you know, is it the upper class that's really purchasing everything or, or not? But think about what's coming into this country, into Europe, into America from, from China. It's not mansions. What we're importing is what? Shoes, glass screen TVs, basic consumer products, things that the average Joe is going to have to buy. Because Bill Gates is not going to want 5,000 glass screen TVs. Maybe 100, but not 5,000, or 20, or 20 billion units. <coughs> and most of the global goods are, in fact, consumed by the richest 20% of the world's population, which, you know, not surprisingly, would be located where? The United States, Japan, America. But how are these people consuming? It's been shown that, at least in the United States, people are consuming based on debt. And here I have some various figures for you. And here's the problem. What happens if you can't pay your debt? What happens if you're downsized? Uh, what happens if, let's say, you're your home value goes down if there's a market crash. Because I understand that there's good debt and there's bad debt. But Americans now, what, what they've done actually, and what the argument of uh, Black and Fitzgerald was, is that the middle class in the 70s realized that its income was not growing sufficiently to keep up the living standards that we've been accustomed to in the United States that we call a middle class living standard. So what they did is they, tar they started taking out uh, uh, using credit, taking out loans from credit cards. And you see at about that time, the increase in credit card debt in the United States. In other words, the middle class was been, has been using credit cards as a source of income. Well, the problem is you've got to pay that back. And at some point, credit cards get maxed out. Then what? Then you go to what? Home equity loans. Now, you can say to me, look, if I got a home equity that it went from half a million dollars to a million, that's a good thing. I'm not that poor. I can afford to use my home equity. Well, yeah, but that's an illusion. That's an illusion. Because if you don't sell your home, you don't have that money. And what if your home value goes down? The debt doesn't disappear. It stays there. And what if your home value stays fixed? It doesn't increase. Then you can't keep taking money out. But you still have to pay the interest on what you owe. And even more scarier, household debt is a percentage of after-tax income. Look at what it was in the 1950s versus now. So my point is that if we come to 120% in uh, 2005. And over 100% in 2005. So what I'm trying to say is that the emerging global SSA is extremely efficient when it comes to production. It's very good when it comes to creating global commodity chains and efficiencies and so forth. But there's a problem. Capitalism to work relies not just on production, but consumption as well. And I think that we have restated here the classic problem of overproduction and consumption. Because what happens when people cannot afford to buy these products when there's no more credit? Then we have stagnation. And we don't have, as we did in the past, in the Fordist era, uh, a necessary regime for consumption. That has been neglected. And that's going to be the ultimate problem. Now why, in conclusion, um, why do, well, before I tell you this, what would be some solutions? Well, one solution would be to engage in Keynesian spending, if we want to stimulate the economy and so forth. But as a lot of you have said, that's probably not going to be in the cards. Another solution is to re-regulate the economy to balance uh, the problem of a profit squeeze when labor has the upper hand, or the problem of inadequate average demand when capital has the upper hand, as uh, Marty was saying to us. So we really re-regulate the balance of power between capital and labor. But again, that's not going to be a permanent solution. Why? Because things do change. Um, 
The other problem, and this is why I call the paper an adequacy analysis versus a Marxist analysis, is that in a democracy, when somebody can spend the money any way they want, this is going to have more power and influence over the government. He who has the money and therefore can use his money to make the rules. So government is not necessarily going to be your ally. And what is the, the problem, ultimately, at the fundamental level? Private property. And that's the elephant in the room. When somebody controls everything, they have all the private property, then obviously they're going to win in this conflict. And nobody really wants to address the issue of private property and how we may have to change our political economic uh, organization of society. And to conclude, I would say we need to go back to basics. Sociological theory 101. Relations of production, forces of production, mode of production. Well, today, they're based on what? The mode of production. Capitalist private property rights. Mode of distribution, based on politics and power. Money. Mode of consumption. If you have money to buy what you want from the markets, then yes, otherwise no. What I believe is that we have to look more seriously at the possibility of engaging in what advocates would call direct action to change what? The relations of production. We have to start talking about the possibility of moving on to some new empire. And that cannot happen if we all take capitalism for granted and that it can never change. We have to understand that at some point, somebody went up to the feudal lord and said, you know what? I don't want these guys to be serfs. I want them to be able to go to my factory. Well, today nobody says that. They're saying these things. But today everybody says, well, capitalism, you have to be a little naive to say we're going to end capitalism, the private property is going to be taken away, and the power of corporations is going to be banished. Well, maybe we have to start thinking this, because I don't see any other way that we're going to have a future without these perpetual problems of uh, boom and bust. They're always with us. And that was pretty much the general point that I was trying to make this video.